Great. Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is John Edgar. I'm a member of the Meredith Historical Society's Executive Board, and I'd like to welcome you to our June 4th meeting. Typically, our first order of business is a Pledge of Allegiance, so if you could stand and face the flag and join me in the pledge. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. entitled Yankee Ingenuity, Stories of Headstrong and Resourceful People. The program will be presented by storyteller and oral historian Joe Wagner. Joe received her PhD from Harvard University. She spent 31 years as a professor at American University in Washington, D.C., teaching literature, folklore, American studies, and storytelling before returning to her family home in western Maine. She's past president of the American Folklore Society and the National Storytelling Network. Joe will share with us a selection of historical tales, humorous and thought-provoking, about New Englanders who have used their wits in extraordinary ways to solve problems and to create inventions. This program is made possible tonight by a grant from New Hampshire Humanities. We're grateful for their support. New Hampshire Humanities sponsors more than 650 educational and cultural programs each year all over the state. If you're interested in learning more about New Hampshire Humanities, you can go to their website at www.newhampshirehumanities.org. New Hampshire Humanities has provided a very brief evaluation form for you to complete, and they suggest thinking of it as the price of admission. It's a little white pieces of paper. There's eight simple questions, multiple choice, they do ask for contact information, which is optional. If you don't want to be followed up by anybody, just don't fill that one out. But they want to get your feedback on tonight's mm -hmm. program. So those can be dropped off at the table in the back on your way out tonight. We have extra pencils. If anybody needs anything to write with, just let us know. These evaluations ensure quality and help everyone get future funding. So please fill them out and drop them off before you leave. With all of that out of the way, please join me in welcoming to Meredith, Joe Radner. Well, I'm impressed to see you all. Wow. Um, how's the sound? Can you hear it in the back? Okay. Good. Um, I, and I will start with a slight apology. I appear to be, this season of year, allergic to every tree in northern New England, so... If I sniffle, it's nothing contagious. <laughs> well, Yankee ingenuity. <clears throat> you know, I was raised with that phrase. Were you? Did you have that growing up? I do not think we could establish statistically that Yankees are more ingenious than anybody else but we're prouder of it. <laughs> we talk about it more. You know, in my childhood, Yankee ingenuity was a phrase that well, had several kinds of purposes. Sometimes it was just, it was genuine admiration for somebody, mostly for making do, mostly for creating something out of nothing, or out of what didn't seem like something relevant, you know. The guy who, long before they were manufactured commercially, invented his own snowmobile and rode it up bald face in the winter. Now that kind of thing, that was Yankee ingenuity. And Yankee ingenuity was also, it was a lot about making do, come to think of it. My Aunt Beth, she could feed a dozen people on a half a pound of hamburger. <laughs> That's Yankee ingenuity. She, she built herself a camp, she was a librarian, and librarians Nowadays, of course, they make huge amounts of money, but in those days, they, in those days they didn't, and, and she didn't have much, and she, she wanted to build herself a camp, and she rounded up wood from wherever she could beg or borrow it, and she found my great-grandmother's old wood stove and brought it down. It's a great stove, and she built herself, with a certain amount of help, a camp, and later on, after she was gone and could no longer use it, I decided to build my, my winter home on the footprint of her house. And we took it down, and the carpenters who took it down said there were not two pieces of wood the same length in the whole house. <laughs> well, that's Yankee ingenuity, right? right? 
but it had a somber side also in, in my childhood. It, I don't know if you know this about Yankees, but irony rules. When I was a kid, I used to love to fish. And I read in, in the wintertime, I would read, you know, Field and Stream magazine and all these things that had all these accounts of people pulling huge walleyes. I, I never pulled anything huge out of anything, but I used to dream about it. And then back they had plans for things you could build. So one summer when I was a kid, I built myself a fishing raft. And it involved, as I recollect, two truck inner tubes and a couple of 36 foot inch square pieces of plywood and some old pieces of two before framing those and they were attached together somehow and the front piece of plywood had a half a circle hole cut in it and the idea was you put your fishing stuff on the back piece of plywood and then you sat in the front with your feet dangling through the hole don't get ahead of me on this. <laughs> and then you propelled it by kicking, uh, which of course would not disturb the fish. <laughs> and I was quite proud of it. And I, my family came down to the beach to observe the first launch. And, and I climbed onto it and it flipped over and wound up upside down with my legs. <laughs> And my father named it Yankee Ingenuity. <laughs> so, anyway, that's the way it goes. I have a bunch of stories that I'd love to share. I've been collecting and listening to and telling stories most of my life. And stories about ingenuity are actually quite varied. Some of them are stories about good inventions and some of them are distressing and some of them are hilarious and I like them all. <laughs> I actually <clears throat> uh, published a CD called, oddly enough, Yankee Ingenuity, Stories of Headstrong and Resourceful People, of which there are two copies left, which I have up here. Um, but I've got so many more stories, I'll tell a couple from that. I just start with the historical one because you're a historical society. Um, this is a story about a woman who was one of the first pioneer settlers of the, the village that became Norway, Maine. How many of you have been in Norway? It has it has changed since this time, but her name was was Elizabeth Stevens. But she had a nickname which she had acquired by virtue of her own outrageous ingenuities. Uh, she was called Wimble Betty. And the Stevens family was a group of, was what part of a family group that moved inland from Falmouth, which was the name of Portland in those days, right after the revolution, <clears throat> when inland Maine opened up for settlement. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and they founded the town that would become Norway. It was a, a rough time because there was no road. You know, anything that they needed in Norway, they had either to carry or drag 45 miles through the forest, over the hills, across the brooks, and so on to get there. And when you got there, nothing was in pretty good supply except for rocks and water and trees. So everything else had to be brought in, and there were some hard times, but they also managed to make the best of it and sometimes got a little extra. On one occasion, the men of the settlement that became Norway pooled their resources and went to Falmouth and bought a very large barrel of West Indian rum. <laughs> and they managed to get it back to Norway on a scoot sled all that way. They set it up on sawhorses in the cellar of the Hobbs cabin. It developed fairly soon that most evenings, most of the men of Norway had urgent business with the Hobbses. <laughs> and they were getting home later and later and in worse and worse condition. And 
their wives were getting sick of it, but they didn't know what to do. And then Betty Stevens came up with the answer. One day when the men were all off at a barn raising, she led a delegation of wives to the Hobbs cabin. And they went down cellar, and the other women held candles for light, and Betty took a wimble. You know what a wimble is? It's an old English name for a hand drill, an auger. And she got down underneath that barrel with her wimble and drilled a hole in its belly. And all that rum flowed out and settled into the dirt floor of the cellar that evening. When the men realized what had happened, they had a very hard earned rum. There was such an explosion of rage in Norway that the women were terrified, and some of them turned state's evidence and said it had been Betty's idea, which it had. <laughs> And Betty was in so much danger, she barricaded herself into the loft of her cabin for a day and a half. But finally the rage settled down. The memory did not, this was Maine. <laughs> and for the rest of her life, she was Wimble Betty. <laughs> well, a couple of years after that, finally they completed a road that a wagon could navigate between Falmouth and some of the inland settlements, including Norway. And as soon as that road was done, an enterprising peddler with the ominous name of Wiley Swift <laughs> decided he would set off on a merchandising journey to the back country. And he got his wagon ready, and just as he was about to leave, a brig docked from Cuba with a cargo of molasses and <coughs> And something that even on the coast of Maine in those days was very unusual, coconuts. And Wiley looked at those and he said, you know, huh, they won't have seen anything like that in the back country. I bet it'll be quite a novelty. And he bought a couple dozen of them and loaded them into his wagon and set off. He went from settlement to settlement, doing a pretty good business because people needed what he had to sell but nobody bought a coconut. Either they were too weird or the you know, people in the back country, they didn't have much in the way of cash money at all. If they were gonna buy something, they would barter for it, things that they had either made or grown or trapped, and they weren't gonna waste it on coconut. So as it went along, Wiley one day realized he had just one settlement left to visit, and that was Norway, and he still had his whole load of coconuts. He was getting desperate. Well, he arrived in Norway again on a day when the men were away. They were off at a muster of the militia. So when he pulled into the dooryard of the Eastman cabin, Aunt Nabby came out alone, and Wiley reached down into the bed of the wagon, hauled up a coconut, and said, Madam, see what I have brought for you. What's that? As soon as he saw that she didn't know what it was, his imagination went wild. <laughs> Madam, this is the egg of a gorgeously beautiful bird known as the golly whopper. Why, you know, it's not so tall as your ostrich, but it's twice as tall as your turkey. Uh, you could hatch this egg under your goose or wrap it in a little flannel if your goose refuses to set. Put it in the corner of your fireplace, it will hatch in precisely 22 days. Well, Aunt Nabby was a practical woman. She said, what do I want with a golly waker? It's a golly walker, man. Uh, why? I, I would say that no animal <clears throat> is of more value at a new farm where chickens and ducks and lambs are being raised, its, it's peculiar cries will frighten off hawks, owls, foxes, wolves, even bears. Why, I have seen a gully whopper chase a fox for a mile and a half without stopping. <laughs> it is a true fact, madam that no farm protected by golly walkers has ever suffered from those terrible pests. <laughs> Furthermore, uh, the beautiful green and red 
red feathers are much prized. Southern women use them to trim their hats. Well, as he was spinning this out, he could see her eyes getting bigger and bigger, and he knew he had her. She bought two so that she could raise a flock. And she gave him three otter pelts her husband had trapped. And he was off and running. He went from scattered farm to farm to farm. And as soon as one woman heard that her neighbor was about to raise a profitable flock of golly whoppers, she had to have them too. He collected redded flax, sheepskins, goose down, more pelts. In fact, business was so good that by dinner time, noon, he had only one coconut left, and only one farm left to visit, and that happened to be Wimble Betty's. <laughs> well, he pulled into the dooryard, and she came out, and he brandished his last egg. He said, Madam, I have saved my last Gully Whopper's egg for you. Now, Wimble Betty was not like the other women of the settlement. She had spent her youth in Old Salem, which in those days was a port rivaling Boston. And she had seen a lot of ships dock and a lot of cargoes unloaded, and she knew a coconut when she saw one. <laughs> but she knew how to hold her tongue. So she said, uh, what did you say that was? And he launched into his by now very well-practiced pattern and explained to her that if she did not purchase this egg, hers would be the only farm in the village unprotected by golly whoppers. <laughs> and she got him to tell her what her neighbors had paid. She said later on that she, her minds are flashed back to the treachery of those women in the matter of the West Indian rum. <laughs> and she almost let them hatch their eggs. <laughs> but he was too outrageous. So she said, well, uh, what do you want for it? Oh, madam, since it's my last one, and since it's you, I could let you have it for three shillings and sixpence, which in the money of those days was close to $30, I believe. <clears throat> Goodness, I haven't got cash money like that. Oh, dear me, I, I, uh, I got an idea. You know, it's, it's, it's dinner time. How about if we give your horse a feed and I'll, I'll give you your dinner and you can have your dinner and have a smoke in my house and I'll go to my neighbors and see if I can borrow the cash. It was a good idea in his view. She got his horse and wagon closed into the barn gave him a feed, gave him a dinner, and then took off down the road. She got to Navi Eastman, and took just a moment to give her a little lecture on tropical botany. <laughs> and then they set off, going from farmstead to farmstead to farmstead, until marching behind her down that new road, Wimble Betty had seven sturdy pioneer women carrying coconuts, and pitchforks. <laughs> You've seen those great old colonial pitchforks that have the two long, sharp tines. Picture those. <laughs> Meanwhile, back at her farm, Wiley Swift was sitting there with his feet up on the hearth, having a smoke, thinking what an uncommonly profitable morning it had turned out to be after all. He had no inkling that his fortunes were about to change until a coconut came bouncing in the door, followed by Wimble Betty. You golly whopper! You're going to pay back my neighbors for everything you took from them by fraud. I am not. He elbowed her aside, shoved his way out the door, ran to the barn, only to confront 14 sharpened pitchfork tines. <laughs> wielded by sturdy farm women who knew how to pitch hay. He had a choice, surrender 
or perforation. <laughs> All right, ladies, I surrender. Give me back my horse, I'll give you your goods. But when Will Betty was having none of that, she said, no, sir. The man that'll tell one lie will tell two. I'll get the goods. And she went into the barn and pushed out the wagon. The women pitched in their coconuts and took out what they had paid for them. And then she turned to him again and she said, now you fraud, you. There's one more thing. You owe me for a dinner and a feed for your horse. When you've given me two packs of pins, two packs of needles, and three hanks of silk thread, we'll call it square. He paid up. She gave him his horse. And Wiley Swift drove off a wiser man. <laughs> now, Wimple Betty's great nephew, C.A. Stevens, from whose memoirs I have adapted this story, said that Wimble Betty lived to be 94, and in all those years her character did not change. <laughs> <laughs> Yankee ingenuity may be a little outrageous, but it does work. Um, I'm tempted by another. Now, one of, the, one of the hats I wear is folklorist. And some years ago, I was commissioned by a group that was making a, a magazine for tourists in Oxford County. And they asked me to go around Oxford County and make a catalog of the recurrent traditional events in the county. So I did. And I went around and I collected things about church picnics and suppers and baked bean suppers and fairs and all the things you might expect that would recur traditionally every year. And it was in that process that I discovered in the town of Otisfield, how many of you have been in Otisfield? You might have been. <laughs> I discovered in Otisfield that for a hundred years, they had celebrated in August every year something called the Joe Holden Picnic. Well, I was curious about that. So I went to Otisfield, and there, on the top in East Otisfield, actually, a rather tinier hamlet, on the top of a broad, otherwise empty hill across the road from the East Otisfield Free Baptist Church in the Elmwood Cemetery, I found Joe Holden's tombstone. It was handsome, tall, white Italian marble. On the front of it in block capitals, simple New England, Holden. On the side, there was Joe Holden's inscription. It said, Professor Joseph W. Holden, born in Otisfield, August 24, 1816, died March 30, 1900. <coughs> Professor Holden, the old astronomer, proved that the Earth is flat and stationary and the sun and moon do move. <laughs> couldn't have been a practical joke. It was an expensive Italian marble tombstone. <laughs> I wanted to know more about this man who could obviously set aside Copernicus and Galileo and 300 years of scientific exploration. And I wanted to know more about the town that celebrated him for it. As I discovered, Otisfield itself is a place of extraordinary determination and initiative. About 40 years ago, outraged by the fact that their county was about to use their tax money to build a civic center for which Otisfield had no use, the citizens of Otisfield voted to secede from Cumberland County. And they succeeded. Now, Otisfield is in Oxford County, and if you look at the southern border of Oxford County, it goes like this, and it kind of pooches out for Otisfield, and it goes on. But it turns out that determination and initiative were part of the family of the old astronomer, Joseph Holden, as well. 
His mother, Abigail, <clears throat> his mother was a religious woman, and she became convinced at a certain point that the Lord had called her to preach the gospel, which was very unusual for a woman in the beginning of the 19th century. But she told her husband, and he accepted that. He said, Nabby, has the Lord told you where he intends you to preach? The Lord had not. <laughs> well, Nabby, why don't you take the horse, give him his head, and see if he takes you to the place where the Lord intends you to carry out your ministry? So she went to the barn. She hitched the buggy to the horse. She urged him out the back door of the barn, and then she gave him his head. And the horse very carefully walked around the house and back in the front door of the barn. <laughs> I don't know if she preached in the barn. I have heard that she spoke rather too often in church for a woman. But she kept on working on her faith. And some years later, she became convinced that so strong was her faith that she, like Simon Peter in the Bible, could walk upon water. So she told her husband, and he accepted that. And they got into the buggy together, and he drove her down to the shore of Saturday Pond in Otisfield. She got out, and she walked down to the edge of the pond, and then kept on walking. Her voluminous Victorian skirts rose up on the water and then sogged down, and the water rose to her knees, and when the water got to her waist, she decided she still needed to do some work on her faith. <laughs> so she turned around and went back to the buggy, and they drove home. Well, her son, Joseph, inherited some of those qualities from her. If you look at the biography of Joseph Holden, he looks like a solid, ordinary citizen. He owned, I think, three sawmills in Otis Field. He was a businessman. He was a solid anti-slavery man. He studied law. He didn't practice law, but he used it in his business. And he used it in the business of the town. Because the people of Otis Field, evidently not thinking that his astronomical beliefs would get in the way of civic judgment, elected him selectman several times. But he had those beliefs. <clears throat> he really did believe that he had proved the earth is flat and stationary, and the sun and moon do move. He had devised an experiment. To, to the best of my ability, this is what I think it was. He took a measured quantity of water, poured it into a basin, and set the basin on a stump overnight. And in the morning, he came out and he measured the water in the basin, and it was still the same amount. He said, well, now look here. If the earth had turned over, then that water and the basin and the whole state of Maine would be up in the roof, and they're not. And if the earth had just wiggled a little bit, why, some of that would have sloshed out. Evidently, he had also not heard of Sir Isaac Newton. <laughs> but like his mother, he felt obliged to preach his faith. He took two big pieces of canvas. On one of them, he painted the solar system the way other people thought it was. And on one, he painted it the way he knew it was. <laughs> and he rolled them up, and he would go from time to time from his mill on lecture tours. He lectured in Boston, in Portland, all the way up the state of Maine to Aroostook County. In 1893, he went to the Chicago World's Fair, and he lectured there. He charged 25 cents for his lectures, which was substantial. And he always ended them the same way. He'd make his case. Then he would look out over the assembled multitude and say, now, which of you now believe that the earth is flat and stationary and the sun and moon do move? And hands would go up, and he'd say, unanimous, and turn around and walk out. <laughs> In his older years, he took to haunting the state house in Augusta. And if a legislator walked by, he'd buttonhole him and tell him his theories. He's a very unusual lobbyist. And he wasn't easily moved. 
Uh, one reporter for the Lewiston Journal quoted him saying, well, the other day, one of them professors from Bates's College came to me and he said, now, Mr. Holden, there ain't no questioning them arguments of yours. And I hadn't given him half what I had up my sleeve. <laughs> he was tested, however. On one occasion, the, the rowdy youth of Otisfield came to him and said they would like to conduct an experiment to prove him wrong. They took a, a stake, a wooden stake, and they hammered it in about halfway between the mill building and the mill pond, um, vertically in the ground. And then they took an old white <coughs> ceramic chamber pot and balanced it upside down on the stake. They said, now, Professor Holden, if in the morning that chamber pot has fallen off the stake, will you acknowledge that you're wrong? And Holden agreed, provided that if the chamber pot was still there, they would acknowledge that they were wrong. Running a mill is evidently a very difficult business. Holden had to work quite late that night. A passerby after dark could have looked through the window of his office in the mill there and seen him sitting at his desk and the light from the lantern on his desk gleaming out on that white chamber pot and gleaming on the shiny steel barrel of his shotgun there. <laughs> Turns out he had to work all night. And in the morning, the chamber pot was still there, and the boys had to agree they had been wrong. <laughs> well, Joe Holden was, like his family, a member of the Otisfield, East Otisfield Free Baptist Church. And when he died, he left money. He left $300 to the church for the purchase and inscription of that Italian marble tombstone. And he left an endowment of $3 a year to support the annual Sunday school picnic. Some years later, another stubborn Otisfieldian added to that legacy to provide strawberry ice cream, peanuts, and popcorn for the picnic. And I recently talked to the pastor of the church who does not like strawberry ice cream <laughs> and she tried to change the will to permit the introduction of chocolate, <laughs> but she failed. Otis Field is a stubborn place. <laughs> so to this day, in the last Sunday of August, at the East Otis Field Free Baptist Church, people come from all the towns around to <laughs> celebrate the annual Joe Holden picnic. And as the late Nellie Hankins said, we raise our cups to old Joe, not, not for his scientific acumen, but for his contrary and positive character. <laughs> Joe Holden. stories from people and to listen to people's stories. And sometimes they're hard stories. One of the hardest and most important things that I've done personally was a year that I spent some time ago interviewing residents of Brownfield, Maine, who had experienced the terrible fire of 1947 that destroyed that town. Brownfield is just south of Freiburg, where my family comes from. And these are, these are people who were elderly. They didn't want to tell the stories themselves. In fact, it was hard for them to tell me uh, as I was interviewing them and collecting them for their historical society. But they wanted them told. So I created a story of their stories called Burnt Into Memory, and it's a CD now, too. And surviving a fire, this wildfire that came through the town in four hours simply destroyed 80 to 90 percent of the town. All the public buildings, so much, just left it ashes. Um, it takes some ingenuity 
Sometimes Yankee ingenuity is life-saving. And there's a little story from that big project that I want to share with you. It was about a woman named Mabel Stone. Um, in those days, in the 40s, in Brownfield, maybe one family in five owned a vehicle. So escaping from a town, from a wildfire that was barreling through, was not easy. And Mabel Stone, she, she lived in, on Dugway, near the center of Brownfield, and she was a retired school teacher. She lived alone, but she had a little dog named Woofy. Well, a big dog named Woofy. She had rescued him, and she loved Woofy. And right before the fire came through on that Thursday afternoon, some of her neighbors drove up in a, in a car and said, Get in, Mabel, we'll take you to safety, but we don't have room for Woofy. And Mabel said, well, I'm not leaving then. I'm going to stay here with Woofy. And she made a plan. She went upstairs in her house. She got two blankets. And she brought them downstairs, and she hung them on the newel post at the foot of the stairs, just inside the front door. Then she got a bucket. She didn't have electricity or running water, but down in her cellar, there was a cistern that filled with runoff from the mountain nearby. So she took her bucket and she went down again and again to the basement and filled it with water and went outside and threw the water on her yard around to wet it down. And then she filled the bucket one more time and she got her broom and her snow rake. You all know a snow rake. Sometimes when I tell this story, I have to explain. It's so good. She got her broom and her snow rake and she went outside and she waited. And when that fire threw fireballs at her feet, she dumped the broom in the bucket and beat them out with a wet broom. And when it threw the fireballs on her roof, she took her snow rake and she pulled them down and she beat them out with the wet broom. You see, her plan was that if the fire got into her house and she couldn't get it out, she couldn't help herself, she'd take those two blankets and she'd dunk them in the bucket and get them wet. Then she'd take the blankets and Woofy and run to the cow pasture behind her house. And she and Woofy would lie down under those wet blankets and wait for the fire to burn over. <coughs> but she didn't have to do it. Friday morning, the only building left standing on Dugway was Mabel Stone's house. And she was long gone by the time I was interviewing people about the fire, but I did talk to her great nephew, Burton Brooks. And he said, nobody will ever understand how she could have stood it all that dark night with the houses burning around her and that, that Universalist church across the road bursting in flames. I think. I think she was too stubborn to burn. <laughs> She's one of my heroes. <laughs> program. You should have something serious, shouldn't you? Okay, I'll do a serious ingenuity thing, a short one. And then, and then, and then I'll close with a, a modern uh, bit of ingenuity. This is a story that, it's a Sufi story, it's a folk tale, and it's got a fair amount of wisdom in it about ingenuity. Four men were walking through the forest. They were old friends. They'd grown up in the area on farms together. But then three of them had gone off to universities and they were now world famous scientists. The fourth man had stayed home and he was a farmer. So the four of them were walking through the forest reminiscing and chatting and suddenly they came on a huge pile of bones. Oh. 
said the first scientist. My studies enable me to identify those bones. And he set to work, moving bones around and articulating the skeleton. And then he stood up and he said, that, that is the skeleton of a lion. Ah, said the second scientist. My studies enable me to put flesh on those bones. And he got to work. And pretty soon, organs and fat and tissues and muscle and skin and fur appeared. And lying in front of the four men was the carcass of an enormous lion. Ah said the third scientist. My studies enable me to bring this lion to life. Wait a minute, wait a minute, said the farmer. I don't think that's a good idea. But the others scorned him. You, you are just jealous because you did not receive a university education. So the farmer climbed a nearby tree. <laughs> And the third scientist set to work, and pretty soon the sides of that lion began to rise and fall. He looked around. That lion had not eaten for a very long time. <laughs> Quickly, he devoured the three scientists. And then, satisfied, walked off into the bushes. After a while, the farmer climbed down the tree and went home. Now, sometimes I use that story to introduce more somber stories about things. It seems to me that it has a lot to say about things that we might not have invented. I can think of some things I wish had not been invented, can you? <laughs> What can you think of? Cell phones. Cell phones. Ah, I beg your pardon, what did you say? What else? Only cell phones? You live in this world? The atom bomb, perhaps? I have sometimes, you know, the, the uh, gasoline engine. Well, we won't go there, but, but it is a serious thing, and I'm actually, I'm going to share a poem with you. I have a copy, if, if you'd like it afterwards. Um, in lieu of telling you a somber story, but by way of saying that ingenuity cuts many different ways, this is a poem, I suppose if I had my glasses, I could read it. <laughs> poem by, by Wisla Zimborska, and it's called Discovery, and it's really about what one might wish a scientist would do, having discovered something dreadful. I believe in the great discovery. I believe in the man who will make the discovery. I believe in the fear of the man who will make the discovery. I believe in his face going white his queasiness, his upper lip drenched in cold sweat. I believe in the burning of his notes, burning them into ashes, burning them to the last scrap. I believe in the scattering of numbers, scattering them without regret. I believe in the man's haste, in the precision of his movements, in his free will. I believe in the shattering of tablets, the pouring out of liquids, the extinguishing of rays. I am convinced this will end well, that it will not be too late, that it will take place without witnesses. I'm sure no one will find out what happened, not the wife, not the wall, not even the bird that might squeal in its song. I believe in the refusal to take part. I believe in the ruined career. I believe in the wasted years of work. I believe in the secret taken to the grave. These words soar for me beyond all rules, without seeking support from actual examples. My faith is strong, blind, 
and without foundation. So finally, I will go to a, a, a practical example of a man of the 20th century um, who intrigues me. When I was a kid, as I mentioned to you earlier in the melancholy example of my fishing raft, Yankee Ingenuity, I loved to fish. And I was exceedingly proud when I turned 12 and was eligible for a junior fishing license. <laughs> my father took me down to the town clerk's office and I paid my dollar or whatever it was and I got my shiny new license and I put it right in my little tackle box. And very soon thereafter, my father and I went out on the lake fishing in a canoe. <clears throat> and we were fishing and we heard then and we looked in a little aluminum boat with a man who was coming across the lake towards us. And as he got closer, the man reached down into the boat and picked up a hat and put it on his head. And my father said, ah, that's the game warden. He came up next to our canoe and politely cut his motor, introduced himself, chatted about the weather for a bit, and then asked my father if he had a fishing license. My father did, turned it over, and the warden gave it back and said, thank you very much, good luck to you. And I said, don't you want to see my license? <laughs> and he said, well, I certainly do, young lady. Do you have it with you? So I handed over my license, and he gave it appropriate, serious consideration. And then he said, your documents are in order. <laughs> <laughs> and he started up his engine and puttered off. I didn't know it at the time, but that was my first meeting with Lovell's legendary game warden, Irvin Lord. I've heard a lot about him since, and he was an extraordinary man. He, um, he didn't have anything except that motorboat on the lake, this, maybe a 10-horse motor, no insignia, he couldn't have run down any malefactors. <laughs> um, but he had quite a reputation. And as I listened, I was hearing certain things over and over about him. People would say, he was a nice guy. He arrested me once. <laughs> His daughter, Pam, said, you know, he treated the public the same way he treated us children. He just give enough rope and we'd hang ourselves. <laughs> and his son, Bill, said, Dad had a sense of theater. And I thought that had to was theater. But he, he was a modest man. He didn't have any insignia on that little boat. Somebody told me he had a hand-cranked siren, but he didn't <laughs> use it. Um, his major tool of the trade, apart from the hat, was a pair of binoculars. And I've been listening for stories about him for some time because I'm thinking about being the only law enforcement officer in a very small town. It's a special situation, you know? Your children go to school with everybody else's children. Your neighbors all know you. You know all your neighbors, some of them better than they wish you did. <laughs> It's a matter of tact, ethics, and a lot of delicate legalities, I would think. So I've been collecting stories about Urban Lord, <clears throat> those binoculars. One day he was out on the lake, and he was using his usual tool to trade, and across the lake he saw a woman standing in waders next to her dock and fishing. And as he watched, she was having a phenomenal day. Really, just reeling him in, reeling him in. And pretty soon, Lord was aware that she was way over the catch limit. So he cranked up his little motor and started to putt toward her. And she sensed his coming, 
turned her back and stuffed the fish down her waders. <laughs> so that by the time he came up to the dock and greeted her, there were just a couple of fish sitting there. He said, well, good morning. How are you doing? Isn't it a beautiful day? He said, oh, yes, it is, Irvin. How's the fishing? Oh, it's slow, but, you know, I just, I just like being out here. It's such a beautiful morning. Isn't it? Yes, it is. And yesterday was a little bit iffy. I thought it might rain, but you know, last week we had quite a bit of rain. What do you think? You know, I chatted for quite a while about the weather, and I don't think all those fish were dead. <laughs> she finally said, Well, Arvin, wouldn't you like to come up to the house and have a glass of lemonade? Oh, no, I, I'm on duty. I couldn't do that. <laughs> I think mean, he knew if she went up there, she'd dump the waiters and he would lose the evidence. So he said, well, how are you, how's your family? How are the children doing? You know, Tell me all about them. And finally, she couldn't stand it any longer. She said, oh, Irvin, you got me. And she took off the waiters and dumped out the fish. And he wrote her the ticket. And she laughed. And he started up his book. That's giving her enough rope, right? <laughs> some, of the, some of the busiest times in the, in the year of a warden, of course, is hunting season. And so those are also some of the trickiest times. Lord was, um, was a warden for our region right after World War II. And in those earlier days, when you, when you shot a deer, you brought it to the warden's house to get it tagged. So one day, it was the last day of hunting season. And in the morning, right after breakfast, a truck pulled up in front of Urban Lord's house, a man and a woman in it, and a nice looking buck in the back. And Lord went out, he knew the family. And he knew that the husband and the sons had already tagged their deer for the season. And here was another good looking buck. So he went out there with his clipboard and he was writing things down. He said, well, nice, nice deer, uh, who shot it? Oh, a mother, mother deer. She, she shot it. Oh, very nice, very nice. Well, where'd you get it? Oh, just up there on the, on the ridge above your house, Irvin. Just up there. I see. Well, when did you shoot it? Oh, about an hour ago. And as he was writing this down, his eyes glanced into the truck, and he saw that mother was still wearing her bunny slippers. <laughs> it was pretty clear she had not been out hunting that morning. <laughs> But he knew the family, and he knew how much the meat of that deer was going to mean to them in the winter. So he said, congratulations, good shot. And he tagged the deer to her, and she went home. He was not easy on people who broke the law wantonly, though. And one of his nightmares was people who went out jacking deer, that is, night hunting with spotlights or headlights so that you could shoot the deer in the headlights, right? He got a call one night from a man who said that there was a truckload of yahoos jacking deer in his back field. So Lord put on his uniform, strapped on his service revolver, and got in his vehicle and said his son Bill could come with him. He drove off to the place and without his headlights, drove up carefully so that his car was blocking the exit to the field. Then he took off his revolver and put it in the back seat. He told his son not to touch it and not to get out of the vehicle. And they waited. And when the truck started to come out of the field and the guys in it realized they could not exit, Lord got out of the car and walked up to the passenger side. The gentleman, hand me your weapons. And the muzzle of a high-powered hunting rifle was pointed right at his face. And he took it and moved it aside and took it out. Now another one, and another one came out and he turned it aside and put it down. And a third, and when he finally had all their weapons, he asked for their ID, he could smell the beer coming out of that truck, and he arrested them. And he said to Bill later on, you know, it was a good thing not to carry a weapon. It's very hard for people to shoot an unarmed man. And Bill was very glad that that was true. <laughs> but I think that's sort of the black theater. Other night activities that he had were 
um, more fun. Particularly in the spring, the smelt season. You all know smelts. <laughs> Little fish about yay long, prime prey for good game fish and delicious in themselves. And smelting is, of course, a long tradition in our area, usually accompanied by buckets, nets, bonfires, and beverages. <laughs> and uh, except in one place, on Keyser Lake, Boulder Brook has been designated for a long, long time as a breeder stream. And therefore, it's illegal to take smelts in Boulder Brook. But of course, it's been designated because it's the one with the most smelts. <laughs> and therefore, if you want a lot of smelts quickly, that's where to get them. So it was always a running little game between Lord and the, the smelters around Boulder Brook. And Lord was very good. He could hide his vehicle so no one would ever see it. He could hide himself so no one could ever see him. And he'd go down there and he'd hide. And men would come down and say, Urban, where are you? We know you're here. Come on out, come on out, come on out. And he'd wait until they were coming up from the brook with their buckets. Then he'd step out and shine the flashlight on them. He did that one night. A man was coming up and he shone the light on him. And the man just dropped the bucket and started to run. And Lord ran after him. And they ran around all the trees. They ran around all the camps around Boulder Brook. And finally, Lord said, for heaven's sakes, you know, I know who you are. Aren't you tired? Couldn't you just stop so we could both go home and get some sleep? And the man laughed. And he stopped. And Lord wrote him a ticket. And they went home. He did not mind telling stories on himself. Another one of those nights at Boulder Brook, he was in his, one of his usual concealments, and he saw a man coming up from the brook with a bucket. And he stepped out and he said, you know, you know better than that, you know it's illegal to take fish here. And said, well, I'm not taking fish. These are my pet fish. <laughs> Lord said, well, how's that? Well, you see, I bring them down to the brook every night. And I, I let them out, and they swim around, a little exercise, a little fresh water, chat with their friends, you know. And then I whistle for them, and they hold the bucket, they come back in the bucket, and we go home. I'm just taking them back home. The Lord said, I'd really like to see that. So the man led him down to the brook, carefully let the fish out, and then shook out his bucket and started to walk back up towards his truck. The Lord said, well, wait a minute, aren't you going to whistle? What for? <laughs> well, for your fish. What fish? He said the job of being a game warden had changed. Uh, it was more like being a traffic cop with the ATVs and the snowmobiles. And he had gone into it after the war because he loved wildlife and he liked to help people learn how to live with wildlife. And it wasn't the same job anymore. But he is not forgotten. He was a nice guy. He arrested me once. <laughs> I was I was driving um, I was driving down through um, through East Conway last fall, and I passed a yard, and then I did a double take, and I stopped, and I backed about 50 feet, because in the yard there was a bicycle, but <clears throat> there was a picture of the, the rear wheel of a bicycle and the seat of a bicycle, but instead of the handlebars. There was a push rotary mower, just the front wheel. And can you get the picture? And there was a fellow sitting in an Adirondack chair back toward the house. So of course I got out and, and, and went over to him. And apparently this was his better mousetrap. He had a lot of conversations with people about this mower. And we talked about how he'd made it after a while. And, and then he said, well, you know, my wife said she wanted to ride on more. 
It's a little beyond making do. Well, go and be ingenious. Thank you for coming. Thanks for inviting me.